What's up guys, Will Gibbons here, and today I'm gonna to be walking you through another Keyshot tutorial, and we're gonna create a pretty cool eye-catching marketing style image. The other day I was scrolling through Instagram and I came across this image by I Am Not Andre, and it's an exploded section view of a speaker design that really caught my eye. I just love the drama, the lighting, the composition, and I thought this would be a great subject for a tutorial. So that's what we're gonna do. Without further ado, grab yourself a cup of coffee and let's dive in. All right, so here is my image that was inspired by Andre's rendering, and this is what I am attempting to show you how to do today. And none of this was done using any Photoshop. This is straight out of Keyshot. And just to show you, if I move on into Keyshot, you can see here's the file. You can see everything is set up in real time. And that's what we're gonna be working towards. Now, if you'd like to follow along with today's tutorial, head on over to willgibbons.com downloads, and you can get the project file as well as the gradient background that is going to be a key component of this tutorial. All right, step one is gonna be choosing a 3D model, and I suggest you use something interesting that's got a fairly complex assembly and is made of solid bodies. So I've opened Keyshot. I'm going to go to its Keyshot Cloud library in the bottom left-hand corner, and now I'm in the Models tab. When I start searching through here, I see this coffee grinder, which I actually modeled when I used to work at Luxion. And since I know there are all solid bodies in here and it's a fairly intricate assembly, I'm gonna go ahead and download this so I can use it for my scene. So whether you're using one of your own models, go ahead and import that into Keyshot, or if you want, head on over to the Keyshot Cloud Library and grab the coffee grinder or something else of your choice and drag it right into your Keyshot scene. Now it's off center, so we're going to deal with this. Hit the green checkbox, hit control one on the keyboard to add a cube in the middle of your scene. Go ahead and hit the green checkbox, then go to the scene tab, select the coffee grinder at the top of the list, go down to position and move tool, and then you're going to pick a new pivot. You'll choose the cube, hit okay, and then now snap to pivot. Now the coffee grinder's in the middle of the scene. Go ahead and hit the green checkbox. We're gonna turn this cube off and save it for later. Now go over to the environment tab, make your environment 2,500 millimeters in the ground plane, 2,500 millimeters. Back to the scene tab, you're gonna go ahead and click that coffee grinder and then hit snap to ground. Now, if you wanna be able to see all the way through these transparent bodies, we're gonna to want to go to the lighting preset tab and just choose product preset for now. All right, now the next step we're gonna want to do is create our exploded view. And if you click and drag, and it looks like the mouse is pivoting around something off center, go ahead and right click on the middle of your part and choose set camera target. And now we should be pivoting around this object here. Now we're actually gonna create our exploded view using animations, as counterintuitive as that may seem. Go ahead and hit the A key on your keyboard to open up the timeline. And the reason we wanna use animations is because it's faster to create, a little bit more precise, and it's easier to edit and undo our exploded view at any time. So the first thing we wanna do is go ahead and click on a part that we want to animate. So if I actually look in the scene tree here, we have a number of sub-assemblies that our assembly is made of. I wanna choose the grinder handle, which is this top part. I'm gonna right click on it and go down to animation and choose translation. Now we see the green bar pop up, that's our animation, and it's one second long. That doesn't really matter. What we wanna do is look at the details on the right-hand side in the properties. Translate Y, which is the up and down axis. If we hit Z on the keyboard, we should see our little um, XYZ axis on the bottom left. So that's pointing up. So if we click on that green bar and change this Y from one to, let's say, uh, 100, Drag that playhead all the way to the right and you'll see that this entire assembly moves up 100 millimeters. Now I'm gonna actually change this to a smaller value, something like 25, and see how it's just floating above the part underneath, that's what we want. Now let's actually go ahead and right click on this animation. The animation shows as a little arrow below the assembly it's affecting. Choose copy animation, then click on the coffee grinder, the very top level, right click, animation, and paste, not paste linked, paste. And now if we uh, take the playhead, pull back and then forward, we see the entire part moves up 25 millimeters. But because we have 
another animation happening inside that assembly, we see that the handle moves up an additional 25 millimeters. So consider the relationship when you're creating these, that when you nest animations, they all affect each other. Now I want the entire grinder to be quite higher off the ground. We're gonna go ahead and pull this off the ground 100 millimeters to start. And now what we wanna do is create our exploded view, which means we're going to move various components away from the center, both in the up and down axis. So first I'll show you step-by-step step how to create the exploded view of just this handle component. And then once I've done that, I'll probably fast forward through the rest so you can create your own exploded view of the rest of the assembly. So whenever you wanna move a part, just click on it once in the real-time view and it gets selected. And then you can see in the scene tree, it's highlighted. I am going to right click and go to animation and paste animation. And now all I have to do is pull the playhead back and then forward. And we see once again, this has been exploded. If I click on the actual animation, either in the scene tree or in the uh, animation timeline, we'll get the properties on the right hand side and then we can adjust those values as needed. So if 25 is a little bit tall for me, I'll go ahead and type in something like five and now we can see it's just been moved off this handle. I want to go ahead and right click this one and I'm going and copy it and then I'll go ahead and click on this pin and I'll go ahead and right click animation, paste animation and just pull this back and forward and we see that the pin moves up. So go ahead and select this and this one's probably actually gonna be better sitting up at that 25 value or so. And now for the little pin down below at the bottom, I can just right click animation, paste animation, do the same thing and see it's moving up. I actually want it down because it would collide with the handle. So let's actually click on the animation and use a negative value. So just put a negative in front of translate Y and now it moves down. And that may not be far enough. Uh, let's do points and minus seven. And again, we're just basically moving these away from their origin to create some space between them so our eyes can kind of understand how they relate to one another. I'll move a couple other parts, but really from here on out, the rest is going to be rinse and repeat. The same exact tactic that I'm using here for the handle, I'm gonna use everywhere else. So this is where you're gonna do this next part on your own. So at this point, we've made our exploded view. Basically what that means is we have all of the parts not really touching each other. They're kind of separating or pulling apart from one another. And I've just given uh, some comfortable space between all of them. And don't worry if everything is not exactly where you want it. The whole reason we did this in animations is so we can easily go back and change the position of something. So if I want this acrylic part at the bottom to change its location, all I do is click on it once. And then in the scene tree below it, I choose the animation and I can type in a new value here to nudge it up or down. And if you really wanna be precise about this, you can go about and name all of these animations so they don't say the same thing. But in our case, we're just using this as a tool to position everything, so I don't think it's totally necessary. Now step three here is to create a cutaway view. And that's going to be actually cutting away half of this object. So here's how we're gonna do it. Remember that cube we had in our assembly? We're gonna turn that back on because we're going to use it now. Let's go ahead and get rid of our animation timeline for now. You can just hit A. And I'm gonna change this layout to be a, let's see, probably a one by one aspect ratio. Next, I'll grab my cube and I wanna make it a lot larger. So I'll dolly out and then control D on the keyboard to uh, change the position of this cube. I'll go ahead and hit scale. And then I want to turn off these other items click the yellow cube and click and drag to the right to make the cube larger. So we want this to be a little bit bigger than our object. I think that's good. And then I'll hit snap to ground. And then we're gonna change our camera temporarily to the top view. So I'll go to the camera tab down to top view. All right, then I'll choose orthographic view for my camera. And then I will change, turn on translate again, turn off scale. And I'm gonna drag this so it's intersecting with my model. And I basically want this to cut the model right in half. That's good enough. I'll hit the green checkbox. And now I wanna to go to the scene tree, choose the coffee grinder, hit the move tool, 
and now we want to rotate it, but we want to rotate it around its central axis. So if I turn on rotate and I start to rotate this, you'll see it's moving around the center of the cube, which we don't want because we earlier set the pivot to the cube. So you want to actually go ahead and I'll hit X, click on the move tool again. We're going to hit reset to reposition. And now you see that the middle of the move tool is in the center of the model. That's still problematic for us. We want it to be in the middle of the shaft. So we'll go ahead and choose pick and I'm going to search for shaft. And the reason we want this in the middle of the shaft is because the shaft is the part of the assembly that everything rotates around. So it's the center. So we'll go ahead and hit OK. And now our move tool is where it should be and we can rotate this. And all I'm trying to do is move this so the edge of the cube is bisecting the little pin in the handle as well as the center of our object. So this should work pretty well, just like this. And I'll go ahead and hit the green checkbox. Now if we change our camera view, we want to go back out of ortho, back into perspective, that'll do. And what we want to do is turn this cube into a cutaway material, so double click it, change it from the drop down menu to cutaway, and we should see half of our model disappear. Now there are a couple things to consider. Sometimes the cutaway material, if our camera's inside it or if we do some other things, you can get some weird artifacts. So a couple things to think about real quick. <clears throat> I'm gonna put this back onto diffuse. Uh, one thing to think of is the smaller your cube is, the better. So we don't want this to be unnecessarily large. So if you were to select the cube and hit control D as in delta, and then turn on scale, we could probably make this maybe not quite so tall. All right, so now that we've got our cube, we're gonna make sure it's a cutaway material. Once again, double click on it, go down to cutaway, and we want to choose inherit caps. And what that will do, it will warn us saying that you wanna have a solid enclosed volume, not surfaces, we say okay. And it takes a second, but what that means is this material should take on the same appearance that the rest of the body is made of, which is good, that's what we want. So that will look like this has been cut away with like a saw or some sort of water jet or something. So it looks pretty good. Now the other thing you might notice if your cutaway material is on the ground, that it can create some artifacts. So we wanna make sure that the cube is not touching the ground, just lift it off the ground a little bit. Let's also go ahead and make some other adjustments here. So for example, if we want to improve the look of the lighting on these surfaces, sometimes it's beneficial in your lighting preset to add a few more GI bounces. Sometimes I'll put this up to anywhere between one and 10. Um, this will slow it down so you don't wanna to go too high here. And the other thing is I don't care for ground illumination. I'm gonna uncheck this box here. That's gonna turn off light that's bouncing off the ground plane. All right, step number four, let's get our camera set up. This is quick and easy. We're just gonna to go to the camera tab. Go ahead and look at your model, however you wanna look at it, and create a new camera. And then we're gonna call this render, and then we'll go ahead and, what I did to get that kind of off axis rotation was I simply twisted the camera instead of rotating my entire model that made things a lot easier to manage instead of rotating a bunch of parts. And when you have multiple rotation animations on a part, sometimes they can get weird in key shots. So I just said rotate the camera instead. And then I wanted kind of a cool three quarter view. So I think I went in something like this. So I actually wanna go down here into our perspective slash focal length and increase this to a higher number. I chose I think 100 or maybe 120 even to kind of give it that orthographic kind of squashed view, which is getting pretty popular in marketing imagery. All right, so now that we have an approximate camera saved for our final render, let's actually go ahead and make another camera. This one, we're gonna take the twist down to zero because it's easier to work on our scene without it. And then we can go back to that final render camera when we're ready. So go ahead and just save your new camera. Now, before I forget, I actually want to address a couple things. Everything in our model has been cut in half, but there's actually a couple components that I think I would rather not be cut in half because it looks better. For example, I think the spring down here, as well as the shaft, they kind of lose their appearance. They don't look as nice being cut in half. So I'm going to suggest that we go ahead and double click on our cube material. On the right-hand side, there's this plus add excluded objects. And I'm gonna search for the shaft 
and I'll click on it and hit OK, and it's gonna add it to the list, and now it's not being cut in half. I'm gonna do the same thing for the spring. So I like the way the spring looks, but I just don't wanna lose it. And because these are metal or metallic objects, they're going to do much better reflecting the light since they're nice and round, whereas the rest of these with the flat surfaces are gonna look a little bit better being cut the way they are. And this is, of course, personal preference. Don't feel like you have to do this. But it is one more way that you can extend the use of this cutaway material. Okay, so the next thing that we wanna do is get into our lighting. So this is our boring startup lighting environment, and we're actually going to do two things. We are gonna use an HDRI, but we are also going to use an area light to give us that nice highlight on the surfaces that we're gonna be looking at. So let's go ahead and hit Control-5 on the keyboard to add a plane. And you'll notice our animation goes back to the very beginning. That's okay. Just hit the green checkbox for now. And here's what I'm gonna recommend. A on the keyboard, drag your playhead to the end. And now let's go ahead and hit O on the keyboard to open up our geometry view. We can hit A to close the timeline and we don't need this studios panel up. And then from here, what I'm gonna do is use the geometry view to go ahead and move my plane. So I'll right click in the geometry view and say uh, center and fit models. And then there we are. So we see our plane. I'm gonna go ahead and select it, right click and move part. And now let's get our plane in the right position. I'm gonna go ahead and lift it up and we're going to pull it off to the right hand side. I will rotate it a bit and I think I wanna make it quite a bit larger. So I'll go ahead and click scale and again, click in that yellow cube and drag to the right to make it larger. And this is again, gonna to be totally up to you to choose lighting that you think looks nicest. That's good enough, I'll hit the green checkbox and the green checkbox in the real time view. Double click on that plane and change its material down to an area light. Let's go ahead and set the color to be neutral, Kelvin. And if yours is in RGB or something, just go ahead and change it to Kelvin and somewhere near the middle. And now we're gonna have our light shining on our object. All right, next let's go to the environment tab and we're gonna take our HDRI down to almost, well, nothing. Let's just go down to nothing. So you can see right now, if we go to our render camera, you can see right now there's a couple issues. One, my light is visible. Let's double click on our light. And what I wanna do is turn off visible to camera. Okay, we wanna adjust the position of this light. So let's go ahead and right click on the plane, move part. And we want to rotate it around our coffee mill. So we'll go ahead and click pick and I'll choose a pivot somewhere in the middle of the body, doesn't matter where. And I'm gonna move this down and kind of rotate it and maybe I'll rotate it this way. I wanna bring this around to wherever it needs to be to create a highlight on most of these surfaces that I want to draw attention to. And this kind of a three quarter view is looking pretty good if you ask me. And the rest is just, it's, it's, it's up to you, whatever you think looks good. I think this looks pretty good somewhere like this. So I'll go ahead and hit that green checkbox. Now, it's obviously too dark the way things are. So we wanna go to, so we'll go to our environments library and I wanna grab the three panel straight 4K and I'll drag that into my environments on the right hand side. It's set to zero, let's set it to one. And you'll notice it's now fully lit, but it's also too bright. So we're gonna do a couple things. Let's go ahead and take our color for our background and set it to black. And now it's still too bright. So we wanna reduce the brightness of our environment because we're gonna use it basically as fill light. And then we wanna maybe increase the contrast a bit. And I'm gonna bring this down pretty low. I'm relying mostly on that area light. And then this HDRI is there just to fill in the gap. So something like that looks pretty good. I'm also gonna turn off ground shadows. We don't need those while we're in the lighting tab. Now, the next thing you might be wondering is what do we do about our background? In that reference image I showed you in the beginning, you saw this nice cool gradient and I think that's what helps sell the image. So here's what we're gonna do with that. We're actually gonna add another plane. So go ahead and hit Control-5 on your keyboard. And let's just hit that green checkbox. And back to the geometry view, pretty much we're doing the same thing we did before. We're gonna move that part. I'm going to pull it back. I'm gonna rotate it 90 degrees and I'm gonna make sure I'm on the global axis. So I'm gonna hold shift and rotate it 90 degrees and I'm gonna scale it up quite large because it has to fill the background of our image. I will snap it to the ground 
drag it down a little bit. And then from the top view, I want to rotate it a little bit. So this red plane is our image field of view. That's what our camera is seeing. So we basically want this to kind of align and become uh, slightly parallel if we can. That would be the best. Now that I'm fairly close, I'm going to go into local. Now the reason we didn't go to local to begin with is because it will shear your plane. I wish uh, Luxion would fix that. I don't know why it does, but when you rotate on the local axis, it tends to shear these planes, which is not helpful. And last but not least, let's go ahead and rotate it. So we want to make sure that this is not intersecting with the cutaway box. That would also cause problems. If we hit the green checkbox and we see that our coffee mill is now back in its original position, just hit A for the animation timeline and drag this all the way out and close the animation timeline. Now we're looking pretty good. So we have this backdrop and we want to put a texture on it. And the texture we're going to use is one that I made in Photoshop. You guys can use whatever you want. Just double click on this plane, go to textures, double click on the color, and then load the texture that I included for download. And the links down below uh, is just this background gradient. I'll hit uh, open. And you'll see if we zoom out, actually, let's go to our free. There we go. So it's, it's, it's kind of rotated the wrong way. So all we need to do is change it from box to planar and choose center on part and then move the texture. And right here you see we can kind of rotate it, we can scale it, we can also, if you need to, we can flip it horizontal or vertical to get the gradient where we want. And then from here, your best option is to simply go into your render camera and adjust or scale this as needed to fill out the image. So if we need to, we can go ahead and just leave it where it's at and then go to the materials tab and then scale this guy up so it fills out the real time view. And then we can move that texture around. I'll also include a one by one or a square version of this texture as well in case you want it, if that's more helpful. The, the idea was to get this gradient from the bottom right to go dark to the upper left. One more thing, double click on it and change it from diffuse to flat, and that's gonna make it a bit brighter. So believe it or not, the flat material emits just a little bit of light and it's gonna brighten up this and kind of create some nice contrast in our scene. The other reason we're doing it this way is because this here is clear or transparent. If you render this out on a black background, if we didn't have our backdrop plane, this glass, would render out dark like this, but then if you wanted to say in Photoshop, put a color behind it, you couldn't do it. So that's why we're actually using a backdrop that we render in Keyshot to get around that. Okay, we're making it to the home stretch here. Um, before we get to the final touches, I'll say this is where I would recommend you go into your render camera and you start making any tweaks that you want. So what I did for my final image is I decided this glass wasn't too important, but I really wanted to focus on all these internal components. So I zoomed in, I got nice and close, and I kind of cropped my image the way I wanted it, played around with the camera angle, made sure it looked good, and then went ahead and updated that. And then from here, what you can do is you can go and start moving these individual parts as well as adjusting your lighting to make sure your scene looks as good as possible. And now the last step here was to create some scene dressing to really kind of jazz this thing up, if you will. So I went with dust particles and a little bit of bloom and stuff like that and some exposure adjustments. So I'll show you how to do that. We're gonna go and zoom out and we're gonna add again a cube. So I'll hit control one to add a cube. And this cube is gonna get scaled up quite large. It's going to encompass pretty much our entire scene. There we go. So now my camera is just looking at one side of this cube. Double click on this cube to edit its materials. We're going to get into the material graph, double click on diffuse, change its color to like a mid gray. And now we want to make dust. So right click, go down to geometry and choose flakes and plug that into geometry. Double click on our flakes. And let's just hit execute geometry node, 0.5 millimeters. Let's try that, refresh, it's looking better. 
And now what we want to do is actually change the size variation, maybe point, uh, let's just do two, two for the size variation. Now we got some big and some small parts. Now there's too many of them. So let's change our density down to 0 0.01 and then refresh again. So now we have much less or fewer pieces. Let's make them smaller. So size is going to be 0.1 mil and then execute again. Now we're getting better. Now I want to increase the density. So I'll bring this up to say 0.3 and I'll uh, refresh. And now we're looking pretty good. And if they're too bright, let's go ahead and take that diffuse color down a little bit. So they blend in a little better. Now let's see what this looks like with our camera view. So we'll go into our camera view, render. And again, the animation timeline. I know it's kind of annoying, just drag that out. I'll just leave this down here for now. And um, so the other thing to point out is that the cutaway cube is actually probably cutting away, preventing flakes from being right where this is. And that's actually helpful because now we don't have flakes intersecting with our parts here. Uh, hopefully it's working that way. And then if you want to create more contrast between these dust particles, you can go ahead and just dive deeper into that material. Just make these, you know, say four instead of two for a size variation. You'll have some bigger and some smaller pieces. And then we can make the size a little smaller, 0 0.08 or something. And then what I did last but not least, so they didn't look like flakes, so you couldn't tell, is I actually animated this cube so it was falling. So if you go ahead and choose the cube in the scene tree, at the bottom of the list, right click animation, translation, go ahead and set the animation to be something like negative 15 in the Y. And now you can see instead of squares, they actually look like kind of stretched blurry squares. So you can make them a little bigger, so minus 20. And that's, that's probably good enough uh, for my liking. Just play with it, you know. And then what I also did, if you thought that was cool, I actually went ahead and made a smaller or another cube. I just repeated that process one more time. So grab that same cube, right click and duplicate. So now you'll have two cubes in your scene of dust. And you wanna take one of them and go ahead and rotate it. So just hit move. And then the idea with this is to have more dust particles in different orientations. So they're not all moving up and down. So what I did here is make sure that my cube, if I turn one of them off, instead of having the streaks up and down, they should be going in a different direction. So I can actually take this and just do say a negative 20 in this direction. So now these are streaking left to right. And the way this will look if you turn both on is it will look like there's dust particles moving in two directions, kind of moving around your scene. The other thing I did is I went back into the second cube material and I went ahead and made um, one of them have much smaller pieces of dust, like 0.05. Oops, 0.05. And then I made the size variation smaller, but the density higher, so there were more of them. And then this way I created more contrast in the scene. So there's some big pieces, some little pieces, all sorts of stuff. And then maybe make them a little darker, whatever you need to do. And if you don't like the way, the way the dust looks, just go to your flakes and change the seed. That'll give you a new distribution of dust. So it'll move parts around. And what I did is I actually did this um, specifically to get one big flake near the front of the screen. I just did this till I found something that, that looked good where there was like a nice big flake right near the front of the camera. Like there's a big one down here sort of. And then what that meant was when I would turn on depth of field, I would get kind of a big blurring effect. And that would actually make it look like there was a big piece of dust floating right by the front of the camera, which is pretty cool. Since I mentioned it, we'll go back to that camera. I turned on depth of field to kind of blur out some of those pieces of dust. So the way you do that is turn on depth of field, set your focal point right on the part you want to be in focus. And sometimes this can get confusing if you've got a bunch of pieces of geometry in here. So you can temporarily turn off the cubes and make sure that your image uh, plane, the depth of field plane, the focal plane, is right in the middle of the part where you want it. If it's not, you can just play with its location by dragging this and then increase your f-stop till the two other lighter color planes move away from the, the one in the middle. So I'll set this to something like 10. Now, most of my object is in focus and most of that dust is blurred out. So, you know, keep playing with it until it's the way you want it. And then I'll save it and turn on those two cubes of dust. And what we should see is they look splotchy now and a little grainy. 
that's because they're actually blurred out from the depth of field, and that's gonna give us that much more kind of cinematic, dusty sort of look, so to speak. Okay, and we are almost finished. The only things I did in that other image I showed you that I have not explained here is I went ahead and I went to the image adjustments. Um, by the way, if the, the dancing cubes are freaking you out, the little shaky cubes, it's because this motion blur is on and it's really obnoxious. So just hit O to hide the geometry view if you want. So I went ahead in the adjustments tab. We wanna go ahead and I went to the photographic style just because I like it better, and then I went to linear response, so then everything should look pretty much the same. Uh, but from here, I like to play with the exposure, just to kind of play with that. You can play with exposure and contrast. And then I turned on bloom, and when I set that to one, and then I increased the bloom radius to get this nice glow, something like 30, which is a lot. And then I increased the bloom threshold so that we didn't have any of that glow on anything except for the most reflective areas. And then from there, I totally toned it down by taking the bloom intensity down a lot. It's like 0 0.1, 0 0.2. You can also play with the white balance, maybe make it a little cooler or a little warmer, however you want. And that's pretty much all I did there. You can play with, of course, the material settings. I changed some of the materials. For render settings here, um, I think I left everything the same. Just product mode with, I think, 10 uh, GI bounces there. We should be fine without caustics. I rendered in product mode on the CPU. If you're getting too much grain and noisiness, you can go into the image tab and turn on the denoiser and just set this to a small value like 0.5, maybe your 0.25. And then for your final offline render settings, um, all I tend to do is you know, set your image resolution. So let's say uh, 1920 by 1920 PNG. You wanna go into you know, your max samples and for something like this where there's depth of field and um, these little dusts and stuff like that, I think I rendered mine at 500 samples, which I think was, was enough. If you do get graininess, you can always uh, increase this number and just add it to your render queue and then render it when you're ready. And there you have it. I hope you guys had a lot of fun during today's tutorial and I hope you use some of these tactics in some of your own work going forward. If you do, be sure to tag me at Will Gibbons Design on Instagram. I love to see what you're doing. Until the next video, you might wanna check out the playlist on screen. I've been doing live streams every Saturday at 9 a.m. Pacific all about freelancing. So if you are even thinking about getting into freelancing, I think you get a lot out of these videos. But until next time, guys, happy rendering.